glory and honor and praise be unto thee, O ancient of days, and unto the Lamb of God forever and ever this day. We come to bless the living God. We come to honor you with all our heart and soul and every fiber of our being. We come to honor you this day. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna to the ever living God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Be thou glorified this day, my Father. Be thou high and lifted up. Be thou magnified, O eternal God, this day. We worship you. We worship you with all our heart and soul and every fiber of our being. We worship the great I am. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We worship you. I am that I am. We bless your holy name on the Sabbath. We exalt your holy name on the Sabbath. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We declare your kingship. We declare your lordship over the service today. We bless your holy name over the service today. You be magnified in our midst. You be exalted. You be enthroned in our midst this day. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We dedicate this worship. We dedicate our praise to the ever living God. Arise and be blessed. Awaken from your habitation and be enthroned in our praises this morning my God. We ask this Lord today the blessing of God will be upon each one. We pray the anointing to break every yoke. We pray burdens will be lifted. We pray encouragement. We pray strength and hope this morning on every heart. I prophesy freedom of worship. I prophesy liberty of worship worship in the house of the Lord this morning and as we continue Lord lead us by your Holy Spirit now Lord as we ask all these mercies in Jesus mighty name come on let us put our hands together and welcome into the house of the Lord this morning and welcome to those who have joined us uh, via media. We're so blessed to have you this morning. And I just pray today as we get connected, we pray the Lord will bless you. We just pray the presence of God over your home where you are right now and over your life right now. Let us give him the freedom. Let us have the freedom of worship right now as the team will lead us. Come, let us worship Hallelujah. the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, raise your voices this morning to the heavens. Let the angels rejoice with you as you praise this living God. And Jesus reigns in this house. Hallelujah. Come on, let us praise him. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. chains undone sin defeated Jesus is overcome mercy triumph when the third day dawn darkness was denied when the storm was gone unstoppable God let your glory go on Your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Come on, you gotta declare this this morning that nothing shall be impossible for this God. Hallelujah. Come on. Woo! Nothing shall be impossible. 
unstoppable Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable of glory hallelujah to jesus christ come on let us worship him this morning let your hearts be entwined with the holy spirit and let us worship jesus with all that we have
the honor and the praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more a thousand glory, our everything. He's the king of glory. He's the king of all. Thank you, Jesus.
faithful God. We bless you, Lord, that even one day in your courts is like a thousand days, a thousand years, Lord. So we bless you, God, for your word. We bless you for this time. And we're grateful. We ask, oh Lord, you'll help us to focus, to put aside everything, oh Lord, that may distract us, that comes to mind that's not kingdom. And help us to focus on you. And all of God's people said, Amen and amen. Well, I greet you. Good morning. You know, I, was, I spoke to some people a while ago and some people said, you know, they, they don't like when people come to the stage and, and when they talk about soccer or anything because that's not the thing. So I'm not going to talk about soccer. <laughs> I've seen very few, very few Liverpool supporters in the, in the thing. Sorry. You don't have to change the number plate, uh, Salvin. Let me, let me know. <laughs> but you never walk alone. So my message today is on equip, and I, and I thank you for, for coming expectedly to the house. Because we know when, and you feel when, when somebody comes expectedly. So I'm going to go back to basics th this morning, but, but you're going to receive. For even as I uh, titled it equip, the prophetic utterance within the word within what I'm about to share with you, runs vast. And so while it might be equipped to some of you, to, other few, to, uh, to a lot more of you, there would be a lot more meaning. So I don't want to restrict it. I don't want to refine it. I don't want to constrain it to just one. But I trust that you would take the most out of it. Uh, about last month or so, we laid to rest a cousin of mine at the age of 46, who was, who was ill for the last eight to 10 years, picked up some form of disease, either when working or maybe it was uh, too much of protein as he was a, uh, a, a bodybuilder and all this creatine. So we don't know what it was, but it began to deteriorate <coughs> in him and we, we laid him to rest. I was asked to do the funeral with the Pastor Stanley in the back there and one of the things that came to mind as I'm bringing to remembrance the effect that he's had on my life is then I remembered that I'm now a tennis player. Could not afford to play tennis back in the day because we, we didn't have courts and we didn't have the equipment and stuff like that. When we played cricket, we had one community bat. And then you would run over, you'd make the run, and then you come back and then you give the bat, and then you take, take the bat. So uh, some of you all can identify with that. But then I was thinking about Roland and what impact has he had on my life? Even as you think about the people that you love and have passed on, what impact do they have on, on your life? And, and then I remember as a six-year-old boy, he took me to the tennis court. My two cousins and him, and I begin to use their racket. Could not use his racket, I got to use their racket. Because I, I, I was too young, I would scrape it on the floor and I would break it and I'd scratch it and you can't scratch the racket, it becomes a problem. And so I remember going and I didn't have a coach and could not afford a coach. So Roland began to give me his racket and with that racket, I begin to hit the ball. He says, when you go home, draw, draw a line on the wall, not too bright and not too dark, don't let the parents scold you and don't quote me but he says this is what you need to do you take a tennis ball and you hit it above the line and let it bounce once and then you hit it again let it come back he says don't let the ball control you you control the ball didn't have a coach then i begin to take that to the side of the wall where th where the terrain is a bit rough and the bounce would be awkward. And the bounce would not be predictable. And I, then I'm going to be able to move my feet and hit the ball over the line. Count to 20, Gresham. Count to 30, Gresham. Count to 40. Count to 50. Keep the ball in the air. Years later, and then when I finished break, his, his sister's racket handed me his racket. Says, I'm coming back for it. I'm not giving it to you. I'm lending it to you. He never took it back. He, he never asked for it back. He handed it over to me. Fast forward to, tw uh, to 2021, after COVID and they, and, they, and they locked down the squash courts and all of these things. Like I, 
step, in, step into a tennis court. And the guy say, okay, who, who has coached you? I don't have any coaches. Okay. The rules of the club is that you have to play a seeded player in our club because we have to grade you. No problem. Okay. Uh, have you been playing? No, I'm just playing recreational with my own friends. Okay, cool. On the day that I go to be graded to join the club, what they will do is they'll put me into a category, A, B, C, or D. There was nobody available except the number one seeded player in the Larusha Tennis Club. And now I'm playing him. And his CV is that. He's got his colors in badminton and he's playing tennis for 40 years and being coached by the best and I begin to play. All I know is you keep the ball up. You remember the line, the wall, and you put it up. You put it up. If the wall throws the ball there, you run there. Don't let it bounce twice. And I'm playing him and he goes 1-0, 2-0, 3-0, 4-0, 5-0. And I'm saying, oh goodness, I'm going to be rejected from this club. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Remember the coach. Remember what I've been equipped to do. Get the ball back in the court. Don't worry about fed. I don't have the shots. I don't have the technique. Never played tennis formally. Come back 5-1. Come back 5-2. Come back 5-3. Come back 5-4. Come back 5-5. Five, five. And the guy says, okay, let's scrap this game and let's go play doubles there. <laughs> Who's the coach? Coach is the wall. It's an imaginary wall when I was a young man. Begin to picture the ball on the wall and begin to hit the stroke. I hit the stroke and I get the ball back in the court. My motto is this. If you want to beat me, you beat me. But I'm not going to beat myself. If you want to beat me, you beat me. But I'm not going to hit the ball out. I'm not going to hit the ball on the net. I'm not going to do silly things. If you want to beat me, you must beat me. Because there's life inside of me. You can beat me if you can. But I'm not going to beat myself. The story reads of David, the young man. We know that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and a, 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 a dramatic entrance where God begins to tell the prophet Samuel, he says, how long will you mourn for Saul? How long will you mourn for Saul? I've disqualified Saul. But how long will you mourn for him? He says, begin to fill your horn with oil because I'm about to anoint a king. Begin to fill your horn with oil. I've got a picture of the, of the horn with an oil. And he says, and go down to Bethlehem. Go down to the house of of Jesse and I will show you a man and uh, Apostle Craig gave us an awesome uh, analogy put that picture up gave us a he says that when they fill the on with, 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 with oil they'll put a wax at the entrance and the priest or the prophet will hold the, on, the, the, the horn up and go down to Jesse's house in Bethlehem did not know that David was going to reign over Israel for 33 years. What does that tell us? Did not know that there's going to be a shepherd boy. He's going to call himself the great shepherd. He's going to watch over his people and he's going to be the king of Israel. He takes the horn and he goes to the seven sons of Jesse and he says that they put the horn on the first boy and the wax does not melt. It can't be this. God says it's not him. He puts, if the wax melts, it means that he is the elect of God. And he goes to the second son and he puts it there and the wax does not melt. And he goes to the third and he goes to the seventh. And then the prophet says, is there one more? Because the wax is not melting. There's not an anointed. There's not one that has some tenacity inside of him. He's not the one that's born to be a royal priesthood. He's not the one that's born to be a holy generation, a holy nation, a called out people, a peculiar. Is there one more? We know that Samuel said, go bring him. Where is he? He's with the sheep. Go bring him. I will not sit until you bring him to me. He brings the boy I learned from 
from Rai the Apostle Craig that the wax must have melted and he begins to anoint him in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And David is anointed as king. Where does he go? He goes back to the wall with his tennis racket, imaginary line, and he begins to hit it. He doesn't go and tell his people, I'm king. He doesn't go and act like a king. He goes back to the only thing that he knows, that I'm watching over my sheep. He's got his shepherd bag there. He's got his slingshot. And all he's doing is that, that, that day in and day out, he begins to take a stone and hit. Begin to choose a target, aim, fire, target. Nobody is watching him. He didn't know that there's going to come a day. He didn't know that in the next chapter of his life, in chapter 17, he will face a giant. I don't know what's in the next chapter of your life. And you don't know what's in the next chapter and what's just around the corner. But all we need to know is that, are we anointed? Jesus said, the, 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 the Spirit of the living God has anointed me. He's anointed me to preach the good news. He's anointed me to set the captives free. He's anointed me to declare that this year is the year of liberty. This year is the year of jubilee. This year is the year of freedom. This year is the year of financial freedom. For even many sitting here, the floods could have told them, leave the house and go. Never beat you. Never beat you. Made, made a plan. You know, I thank God for the, for the people in there. I made a plan. He had to move out of his house. A lot of you, Warren and stuff, to move out of the house. But if he wants to beat you, let him beat you. Don't beat yourself. Uh, in this generation, we're seeing a lot of people beating themselves. Beating themselves. Beating themselves to death. If he wants to beat you, let him beat you. But don't beat yourself. When you go to the story in uh, uh, 1 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 17 of uh, David and Goliath, you've got to ask yourself, and I touched on this a few times, what are the things, what are the things uh, verse, uh, chapter 17. What are the things that, that irked David that even as he goes to this battle line? And I'll read from 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 4. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, etc. It begins to go on and speak about his arm, army, his armor. Verse 16, for 40 days, every morning and night, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. And as soon as, verse 24, and as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the men asked? He comes out every day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward for anyone that kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. And that man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. Verse 26. David asked the soldiers nearby what will be given. What will the man get? Kills this Philistine and ends his defiance of Israel. And watch this. And who is this pagan Philistine anyway? That he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. That he is, he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I present to you the characters of the story. It's a Philistine champion who's been, who's been a man of war from the time of his youth. It's one. There's David who is going to be the next king that in the previous chapter of his life, he's a shepherd boy, but he has been anointed. And he's been anointed to rule over Israel. But when he goes to, to Goliath, he doesn't say that I've been anointed to be the next king. Are you with me? There's Saul. And then there's the army of Israel. That's on one end. And we've been to that, to that location. And then there's the armies of the Philistine. That's on the other side that they say for 40 days and for 40 nights they begin to torment can't sleep. We are afraid. We're losing sleep. We are anxious because of this threat 
that is right next to us. I told you this before. Say it again. There is another group of people that is in this scene. And let's go to verse 26 again. David said to the soldier standing by, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? And who is this pagan Philistine anyway? That he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. When it came to Abraham, God had to tell him, lift up your eyes and see. There was a ram that was stuck in thicket, a bush. When it came to the prophet and he sent his servant out of the cave, servant came and said, we are surrounded by the armies. We're surrounded by horsemen and we're surrounded by, by chariots. And the prophet said, Lord, I pray you lift up his eyes. He said, go back outside. Go back outside and come back and give me a report. The prophetic eye had seen that. When he came back to the prophet, he just went outside. He just stepped outside and he looked up at the skies. He came back and the report was, I see the skies are lit up. There are chariots and horsemen and fire. And he says, and, and what's the bottom line? your report because the report must always have a bottom line like the doctors say you know diagnosed with one two three four five we know what's the bottom line what's the bottom line and the bottom line was this there are more that are for us than those that are against us he says because the armies of the living god had lit up the mount the bible says that as the mountains covered Jerusalem, so I cover my people Israel. And he who watches over Israel, he neither sleeps nor does he slumber. So he, he that is watching over you for the giants that will come in your life and the meetings that you'll have to be in and the arbitration that you'll have to be in and the court cases you've got to be in and the disputes you've got to be in. Whatever it is you need to be in, if we had the eye, if we open our eyes, like David had the technology to look into the heavens and not just look beyond and not just look into the natural plateau. As we call from above, he says, hey, there are more that are for us than there. And that's what pissed him off. What pissed him off is he said, you can defy my brothers, you can defy Saul, and all of these men of war here, I don't have a problem with you. He says, but you are not allowed to insult the armies of the Lord. You tell your enemy, you tell your sickness, you're not allowed to insult the armies of the Lord. Quick, quick testimony on Tuesday we came. Uh, what did Tuesday? Ashwin did. What a powerful service. And then they begin to go into the prayer, begin to pray for healing. And, and I had a niggle on, on, on my body, uh, an injury. And I spoke to a friend who's got the same injury. And he began to tell me that he's got it for, for three months now. And as soon as he said that, I said, I'm not accepting that for me. Because the symptoms were the same. Come on Tuesday, stand. And I took that prayer. When they said, pray. And say, you, you point and you ask for your deliverance and your healing. You know what I did? I said, I will be healed. I tell you what, the pains didn't go away at the same time. But day by day, it's deteriorating. Day by day, it's going smaller. Pain is going smaller and smaller. And when it disappears, I won't even know. Take me a week later, I'll, oh, where's that pain? Where's that pain? Oh, you're gone. Because at that point, I didn't lose faith because... When I went home and the pain is still there. No. I believe it. If the process takes its course. Let's go. We know the story that, that David's brother came to him, spoke to him, insulted him, asked him, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be here with the sheep. And David began to tell him, sorry, I'm not talking to you. Etc. I'm focused on, on the giant. I'm not focused on you. Verse 32. 
David tells Saul, <clears throat> don't worry about the Philistine. I'll go and fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. 34. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When the lion came or the bear came to steal the lamb from the flock, I'd go after it with a club and I'd rescue the lamb from the mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I'd catch it by the jaw and I'd club it to death, sir. I have done this to both the lions and the bears and I'll do this to this pagan Philistine for he has defied the armies of the living God. That's my motivation. I'm here because he's defied the armies of the living God. Notice he did not say, listen, I'm taking over from you. I'm taking over from you. And even though you know you're taking over from the person. And I started in, the, in, in, in a company a few years later. The guys came down from Holland and, said, and they met me as youngsters. A few years ago, they said, you know, we train you to take over from us. I didn't go tell my manager, hey, they said they're going to train me. Take over from you. Eh? You're shy of me. Eh? You do what it is. Eh? And so by saying that they didn't take an oil and put it on me, Calvin. But I understand and I decode they saw something. That somewhere down the line, this company or another, there's a director post waiting. I'm waiting for it. Because, because out of the mouths of them, whether they were godly or ungodly, they begin to recognize there's something. Many people have said bad things about to me, about me too. I tell you what, I press the slow delete button and it slowly deletes. Slowly deletes. But sometimes, you know, when you get crowned and when you get the when you're there, you like to remember all of the things that your critics have said. Life will be boring if you didn't have critics. Yeah. It's so nice to have critics. Can all my critics uh, pick up your hands? <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to welcome you today. There's you know, guys in the back who can give you a form. Invite you for visitors tea. The visitors' tea was even, you know, the rains came and uh, we could not even have that. I, I drove in the rain and then the roads were closed. I had to turn around, got so uh, scared. But, um, but we'll do that. <coughs> For he's defied the armies of the living God. I want you to know that you are not alone. You're not alone in your circumstance. You're not alone in the attack. You're not alone in the assignment. But God wants you to stand up and say, not only an irritation to you, but they defy the armies of the living God. And when they do that, you rise. <clears throat> the Lord who rescued me from the claw of the lion, claw of the bear, rescue me from the Philistine. Saul in his desperation, because nobody wanted to go. In his desperation, nobody wanted to go. He agreed to send the young man who was there because, he, why was he there? He was there because he was delivering bread. He brought bread for his brothers who were at war. His mom must have made the bread. And you know, sometimes as, um, you know, sometimes women, not much is said uh, about David's mom. Not much credit is given to her. We hear about Jesse. Never underwrite her value and her worth in the story of David and the birth of David. So I want to tell you, woman, that sometimes you may not get the accreditation and you may, may not be mentioned, but your part to play was vital in saving of cities. Your part to play was vital in uh, right, emancipation of communities and bringing food to the table, etc., etc., Verse 38, then Saul gave David his armor. We, we know that David begins to take it off. In verse 39, I can't, I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to this. So David took them off and he went, he picked up five smooth stones from the stream and he put it in his shepherd bag. 
Then armed with only his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to the Philistine. And as I begin to say this, I want you to picture you in any enemy or giant that will stand before you. That's what I want you to do. Because we know the story and we pictured the story and we learned the story. But I want you to go there. I want you to go into your situation where you pick up the five stones. Five is the number of grace. He puts it in the only thing that he has was a shepherd bag because he's a servant. He's a servant leader. Come what may, I'm taking my shepherd's bag with me. Didn't have to take my shepherd's bag, but I'm taking my shepherd's bag and armed only with the shepherd's staff and a sling. The thing that I know with my rugged Bible, with my Bible where the pages are falling off, but that is my sword. That is my strength. That's my healing. I come back to the, to the closet. I come back to my room. And when everybody is sleeping, I put the light on or I put the candle on and I open that Bible and I say, Oh, Bible, oh, God, I want a word of victory. Oh, God, I need some energy. I need some food. I need some sustenance. I need some bread. I need some power. I need some deliverance. I need some medication. I need your anointing. I need the Holy Spirit. I need victory. I need tactic. I need you, God. He takes it and he, and he struts across the valley, across the, the, the stream into the valley to face this Philistine. And, and th that day it could have been over because this guy is bigger than the lion and he's bigger than the bear and he begins to face him one on one. Goliath walked over to David with a shield, with, a, with his shield bearer in front of him, looking at the rugged boy. Goliath says in 43, am I a dog? He roared at David, that you come against me with a stick. I've got a picture there. That you've come against me with a stick. Girl, if you can just switch to that picture and I'll read the text. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, David yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with a, swer with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, of the heavens, of heaven's armies, the, the, the God of the armies of Israel. And that is now, David is beginning to introduce to Goliath, what Goliath could not see. He said you can torment and intimidate and pin down and put in bed and make sick and make sleep the armies of Israel. He says, but you and behold, lift up your eyes, Goliath. Because now, now you chose another battle. You started it now. It's too late. Don't, don't start what you can't finish and it's too late to turn around now the armies God the armies of Israel verse 46 today the Lord today the Lord not I today the Lord conquers you and I will kill you and cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds of the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God. How true is that? And the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. That the Lord rescues his people. But not with a sword and a spear. This is the Lord's battle. And he will give it to us. Can you feel the anointing of God? And Goliath moved closer to attack. David ran, quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag, taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and he hit the Philistine in the forehead. And watch this. The stone sunk in and Goliath stumbled and fell to the ground. So David, tri David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. For he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath, used it to cut off his head. 
He goes into the stream. He goes into where there's living water, where there's flowing water. And he begins to take five stones, the number of grace. He chose not to take a sword and an armor of Saul, but he chooses to take a stone. Prophetically, that's speaking about the Christ. It's speaking about the gifts to the church, the five, the apostle, the apostle, the evangelist, the teacher, and the pastor all locked into one is what God had given to the church. The fivefold anointing. And that five is symbolized in your hand. And if you put your hand into the hand of the Lord, and if you decide to put your feet in everything to the purposes of the Lord, he began to use you. When David was older, when David, I and mean, when he understand how God was functioning in his life, like you are and like I am, when we're younger, we begin to see visions, see things, but we don't really understand how God functions in our lives. Like for me, I know that, and I've seen this, that uh, even in my group of friends, we're praying this and that, and then they get blessed and their waves come frequently. This come frequently. Because then we see the pictures, hey, we've got this promotion and all of these things. But I've always noticed that in my life, the waves are not as frequent. But when the wave comes, the one wave is as, is as equivalent as their five waves that come. I don't know how God unfolds it in your life, but sometimes there's a pattern. Sometimes there's a pattern in how He, did. he makes it dry. It makes it dry and then the moon comes and then the tide goes in and then you dry. But all of a sudden you pull it out and then it, it comes. Right? So in his young days, in his older state, he said this. He said, the hand of the Lord came upon my hand and he helped me to design the blueprints, the architecture for the temple of God. I'd like to say in my version, the hand of the Lord came upon my hand. And when I took that sling, and when I took that sling, the hand of the Lord came upon my hand. And the armies of the living God behind me came upon my hand. He gave me an accuracy. He gave me an accuracy to hit. And not only to hit, but for that weapon in my hand, to, the scripture says, sunk in, sunk in place where he fell to the ground. The Bible says that, that David pulled out Goliath's sword from his side. Verse, verse uh, 54, we read that David took the head of the Philistine, uh, the Philistine's head into Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. He takes Goliath's head and he takes it to Jerusalem, but he takes the sword and he puts it in his own, own tent. Remember that. I'm going to come back to that. And interestingly enough, verse 55, as Saul watched David go out to fight the Philistine, he asked Abner, commander, he said, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner begins to tell him, I don't know now, but I will find out. Verse 57, as soon as David returned from killing Goliath, Abner brought him to Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. And he begins to say, tell me about your father, young man. I like that. Tell me about your father, young man. And David replied, his name is Jesse. And we live in Bethlehem. I want to submit to you that when God is fighting for you, and when he allows you to win a battle, the question will be asked, tell me about can say my father is God the father God the son God the Holy Spirit and you tell them about my father he did not go and say that you know what I've been waiting so long for this opportunity and to air out dirty laundry did not go say when, when the prophet came to the house my father did not bring me to be anointed to be in your court he didn't do that he just said it's Jesse, and we live in Bethlehem. I pray that your children will have such great success in their life that kings and priests 
And wise men will ask them, who are their parents? And then they will say, my mother is me. My mother is you. Mom is for me. And Rebecca and Rachel and all of this, that my mom and my dad is so and so. He did not he did not give a report of his father in his father's weakness and in his father's error and in his father's mistake. Begin to give a report of his father for the good things that he has done. And we must be able to overlook the errors of our fathers. Begin to overlook the errors of our children and begin to help as God is bringing healing in this area because a group of us went to Pastor Craig's church and, and I preached the, the same message but we knew that God will bring out extract something else and one of the things he's extracting is the healing with the father son relationship and the mother daughter and the mother son and the mother daughter God will bring healing and when we go to the table when we go to the table we don't bring out it's not your opportunity to say yeah but you said that and you did that. That's the reason why it's in the past. Is because it's in the past. And the Spirit of the Lord, I pray, will bring healing. And even those that are that are watching, the Spirit of the Lord will bring healing over your situation and over your circumstance. And that happened uh, in verse sixteen and uh, in chapter sixteen and chapter seventeen. In chapter twenty-one, David then begins to face another giant, bigger than Goliath more powerful than Goliath. And who was that giant that he could not run away from? And that Saul. And that giant, the stones are not going to help him now. You see, for the, for the first fight, he had to take the bread. And he had to deliver to his brother. And then he had to uh, uh, acquire five stones. But in chapter 21, there is another giant, and that's Saul. And, who, and what's the relationship between David and Saul at that point? That's his father-in-law. That's his father-in-law. It's his spiritual father. It's his boss. It's his king. And he's an armor bearer. And the code of the armor bearer is, I can't kill my king. And I can't kill my father. And I can't expose my father's nakedness. My father's And Jonathan tells David, my father's about to kill you. So David begins to go and he runs and he goes to the priest. Verse 2 of chapter 21. David told the priest, the king commanded me about a secret matter saying to me, do not tell anybody about this matter I'm sending you to, which you have commanded, which I, I've commanded you. I've directed the young man to a certain place. Now what do you have available he asked the priest. He goes to the priest because he can't go anywhere else. All the other artillery and all the other weapon shops are all closed. Everybody is against him. He's the enemy of the state. And now he runs to the church and he runs to the temple. And very interestingly, what does he ask the priest for? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you have. The priest answered David, there is no ordinary bread available, only consecrated bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. How's that? Give me five loaves of bread. Are you seeing that when you face a one giant, I need five stones. Now I'm facing another giant that's bigger than Goliath. I need another technology. There's more. There's always more. There's grace is sufficient for you. And His grace has been dispensed to you. But you've touched the surface. You've only touched the grace that was at the stream. But there's more grace in the, in the mezzanine level. And there's more grace in the upper room for us to access. And He says to the priest, give me bread. Whatever you else you have the priest said to him the sword this is verse 9 the sword of Goliath the Philistine 
whom you have struck down in the valley of Eli is wrapped up in a cloth behind the airport. If you want it, take it because there is no other like it. And David said, give it to me. He goes to the priest. He understands the technology of grace and he asks him for bread because it's my body is broken for you. This is the bread of life. Eat of this bread. You can't die. I need the stones because I need to kill the giant. But in the next giant, I can't kill him. I, it is not lawful for me to kill him. So don't give me a stone, but give me your bread of life that whatever he does to me, I can't die. And Saul took the spear twice at him and he, and he, and he threw it at him. David moved out and he hit the wall. I can't kill him. And he says, give me that Saul. And that which was opposed him in the previous chapter of his life, and that which was dead to him in the previous chapter of his life now became his strength. And he said, there is no other like him. That you de-arm your enemy. And that which he said, he, he sentenced you to, take it from him. And you go and you bring deliverance. And that Saul, he put in the temple. Remember I said, he took the head of Goliath into Jerusalem. We didn't know where he took the Saul takes the sword, wrapped it up. He went to the priesthood. And he said, priesthood, here it is here. Keep this here. I do not keep this as my trophy. But I put this at the feet of the cross. I put this to the glory of the Most High. And he began to defeat his battle in, in, in all of his life. And in all of the things that he had to go through. It's the shepherd's bag that he takes. It's the sling that he then begins to use with the five stones and the grace. It's the sword that he begins to equip himself with, but all leading to what? What was the culmination of all of these things? The culmination of all of these things was this. anointing you young man and I'm anointing you because one day you will wear this crown Israel did not accept him as king so for seven years he was king of Judah but finally saw the time and the elders of Israel begin to come to David they said we accept you as king the wax is melting there's something inside of you that you can lead us through this pandemic. Israel is divided. You have the grace. Israel is in turmoil. Brothers are not talking to brothers. There's grace. You know the technology. David said, you can take away the kingdom from me. You take away the wives and you take away the city and the money and the gold. But take not your spirit away from me. He was bold enough to say, you can even take away the crown from me. But take not your spirit from me. We've got access to a technology in the grace of God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Can you stand? Let's begin to pray. I've asked uh, so Sox will come up later to do the uh, announcements and to share the uh, share on the offering. Father, I bless you for you're a good God and you have equipped us. For David was anointed three times. Anointed at Bethlehem, Asania, anointed in Judah and anointed in Israel. In all times he was anointed. He was anointed for a purpose. He was anointed for the next stage of his journey and the next stage of his life. 
Lord, we're asking for an anointing from you. We're asking for an anointing from you. We're asking for an anointing from you. We're asking for the oil to come upon us, the oil of gladness to come upon your people, Lord, for the next chapter and the next phase of our lives, O oh Lord, that we'll wear the crown, for we are, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people called out, O oh Lord, separated, God, separated. Help us not to beat ourselves. Because we will not be defeated. For we're a kingdom people. And all of God's people said, Amen. Were you blessed? Come on. You may be seated. Amen. You've been blessed this morning. Amen. We thank God for His Word. Because the entrance of God's Word brings life. Amen. Um, the announcements are as follows. Firstly, we want to say thank you for being here this morning. For coming into the presence of God. And without you, there'll be no church. Amen. We also want to thank God for those that are connected with us in, on social media. We pray that this morning you would receive from the throne room of God. Amen? Amen. Um, the announcements are as follows. This Tuesday is fasting and praying. As you're aware, as Gresham said, miracles happen. If you want a miracle from God, if you want a breakthrough from God, come into the presence of God and you will receive Something, your life will never be the same again. Amen? On Wednesday is Bible school at 6.30. We have two great men of God that are equipping us, and teaching us, and showing us simple, basic, uh, biblical principles that we can use in our future as children of God. Amen? The enemy is there to rob us and destroy us. But if we don't know how to use the word of God, and we don't know how to use the weapon that we have, it'll be useless. Amen? So we thank God that we could be equipped. This Friday, we have youth meeting. We're having a wonderful time in the presence of God. Young people's lives are being changed. We are equipping young people uh, how to face life, basic principles of how to face challenges that they would experience in life. So sometimes as parents, you don't have the opportunity to spend time with your child and show them and train them in the ways of God. Send them to youth. We will have that opportunity to teach them and equip them for life. Amen? Amen. This Saturday, Deliverance Ministry uh, with, Pastor, uh, with uh, Santos Manilal and the team. Um, if you need a breakthrough, if you want uh, a change from some habit that you have, and you want God to deliver you and set you free and deliver you from this bondage, come. We invite you to come and God will do something great in your life. Amen. Amen. Next Sunday, uh, there's only one service at 8.30. There'll be no children's church. Uh, teachers and the staff will join for communion. Amen. Because it's the first Sunday of the month, we'll be having communion. So there'll be only one service. Social, social outreach ministries. This month, the month of June, it is the opportunity to bless and give to the poor and those that are in need of something. So we appreciate your contributions. I think there's uh, baskets at the back where you could come and, and bring your stuff and give. Um, as Pastor said, just one can. Nothing much. Just one can. And you'd be amazed how far that one can can go. Amen. So we thank you for those of you that have always been giving generously. And we pray that you will be blessed for that. Amen. <clears throat> now is the time for giving. The best time of the service. Amen. My scripture reading is Proverbs 18 verses 16. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence 
of the great. Amen? A gift opens the way and ushers the presence of the giver into the presence of the great. Amen? So, when we come here, we believe that we are in the presence of the great, who is Jesus Christ. Amen? And God the Father. So, you know, the church could have uh, instituted a tax. But there's no tax, like how the world has a tax. The, you know, the government has a, a law where you have to pay your tax. Here you come in and you willingly give a gift. And this gift brings you into the throne room of God. Amen? And if you're in the presence of somebody great, what happens? Those that were with Jesus, signs, wonders, and miracles happened when they were in the presence of the great. So this morning, the Bible says that your gift will make room for you. Amen? So whatever you're trusting God for, give your gift. And pastor always says, it doesn't matter. You know, the Bible says one-tenth. But give whatever you can give. And believe and trust God that that gift will open up a room for you. That wherever you need a, a, a breakthrough, financially, healing, whatever it is, restoration, say, Lord, I'm giving you this gift. And even as I give you this gift, Lord, that you will bless it and that you will multiply it and that that gift will work for you. Amen? So we're going to stand this morning. We're going to trust God even as we give. Amen? And we're going to believe that our gift will make room for us. Father, we say thank you. We thank you, O oh God, that we have this opportunity to give. We thank you, O oh God, for every cent that would be given this morning. We thank you that it is being used wisely. And we thank you that in the future, it will continue to be used wisely. We thank you, O oh God, for, for, for whatever the, the, the finances are being used. We see the evidence of the, the expansion of the kingdom of God. And we pray, O oh God, that you would continue. And even as people would give, even as those that cannot afford to give, Father, we pray as a church in unity, O oh God, that there will be breakthrough in our lives, that there will, Lord, every challenge and every difficulty that we would face, O oh God. Father, our gift this morning would make room for us and that, Lord, we would stand in the presence of the Most High God this morning. We give you glory, we give you praise, and we say thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.